Wednesday will be the first Wednesday of the month, prayer meeting. Um, so come on out and let's cry out to God together. Acts 20, verse, oh, let's look at verse 18. The measure of a minister. Now we're all ministers, we're all servants of the Lord Jesus. If you're a Christian, you're a servant, and we all minister in various ways. And we're looking at Paul, the, one of the finest ministers there ever was, and we're looking at the principles from his life and trying to measure ourselves. So here we go, Acts 20, and let's look at verse 18. It says, when they arrived, he said to them, you know, Paul's talking to the Ephesian elders. He doesn't think he'll see him again. This is his farewell message to them. When they arrived, he said to them, you know how I lived the whole time I was with you. It's very important that you live honestly and transparently, that you can say, you know how I lived. You know how I behaved. I didn't hide anything. You saw, you witnessed it, you see. I lived above board, lived above board. You know how I lived the whole time I was with you. From the first day I came into the province of Asia, I served the Lord. I served the Lord. I served the Lord with great humility and with tears, although I was severely tested by the plots of the Jews. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. We'll just hold it there. Now, it's been said one day we will have to give our farewell speech. Can we look back without regret and can we look forward without fear? Can we look back without regret? Can we look forward without fear? Now, Paul's farewell message is a good way to measure ourselves, to see how we're measuring up. It's good to measure ourselves from time to time. Now, there are three parts to Paul's farewell message. First, he, um, he reviews the past, and that's where we're at now. He reviews the past, then he discusses the present, and then he speaks about the future. Now he reviews the past. We started that last time. And that next slide, he reviews the past and he's going to look at the motive and the manner and the message of Paul's ministry. That's where we're at. The motive, the manner, and the message of our ministry, of our ministry. Uh, we looked at the motive, the motive. Next slide, the motive. The motive of Paul, what drove Paul, was he wanted to please the Lord. He wanted to please Jesus. The burning passion in his heart wasn't just to build churches, wasn't just to see, it was to please the Lord. It was to glorify God. Paul's motive, serving the Lord, that was his motive. He says, I serve the Lord. That's the thing that drove me. Serving the Lord, his efforts and sacrifices was for the glory of his Lord. And that's what we looked at last time. We said the motive of Paul's ministry, we see it in verse 19, he starts out, I serve the Lord. He wasn't interested in making money. We looked at that later on. He says, I didn't covet anyone's silver or gold. It wasn't about that. It was about serving and pleasing the Lord. If, listen, if you can get this one, everything else is easy. I want to tell you something, you that are watching me. Some of you are home because, you know, you can't come out. It's a pandemic. Others at home, God knows why. But let me tell you something. When you really want to please the Lord, you love his house, you come out, you serve God. No one's got to call you every other week. Where are you? No one's got to beg you. Can you take part and help out down here? When you want to please the Lord, it's a driving force in your life that motivates your directions and your actions and your willingness and your sacrifice. Somebody say amen. Not interested in making money. Not interested. That's as he went through. In fact, he said he was a servant or a bond servant of Jesus Christ. His motives for ministry were spiritual, not selfish. His efforts and sacrifices were for the glory of his Lord. His, his efforts and his sacrifices for the glory of the Lord. Paul was a man totally devoted to Jesus. He loved Jesus. He would do anything to please the Lord. He was passionate about that. Paul viewed the primary, the ministry primarily as serving the Lord, and he commonly referred to himself as a servant of Jesus Christ, and he wasn't ashamed to say that. Don't be ashamed to say, I'm a servant of the Lord. I'm a servant of the Lord. I don't know who else, anyone else is serving, but I, it's a good thing to be a servant of Jesus Christ. Amen? 
And, and, and that was Paul's his goal. And we looked at a lot of scriptures last week. We saw he said it over again. He, he, the one thing Paul sought was to please the Lord. Not himself and not men, but to please the Lord. That's what he wanted. We looked at many scriptures. He said, I'm not a man pleaser. If I was a man pleaser, <laughs> he goes, I wouldn't be going through all this. If I was a man pleaser, trust me. I would dilute it. I would compromise it. I, don't, I could do without another beating. I could do without another person throwing a stone at me if I was a man pleaser. But I'm not. I'm not here to please man. I'm here to please the Lord. And that's why we do what we do. Amen. We're called to serve God. And when I'm called and I have a passion to serve and please the Lord, it affects how I minister to you. Because I want to please him, I'm willing to give a quality effort and a sacrifice and a diligence towards you. This, I'm doing it unto the Lord. Yeah, I'm doing it unto the Lord. Paul considered a great honor and privilege to serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and, and so should we. And so should we. And so again, we make it our goal to please him. Paul writes that in 2 Corinthians. We make it our goal to please him. You know, a lot, we got that big deal nowadays. You got, this, you got your vision, this vision, that vision. Well, I'll tell you what, if in your vision is not be to please the Lord Jesus Christ, you toss that vision out, you flush it where it belongs. Because if as a Christian, before um, getting out of debt and before all these other noble things, number one, I want to please the one that died for me. I want to please the one I will stand before on that day. Amen? After that, hey, if you pray and God gives you wisdom, good. Set goals, knock them out, make some accomplishments. That's wonderful. But number one, I want to please the one that died on Calvary for me. Amen? Shed his blood, forgave me. I want that more than anything. We make it our goal to please him. So number one, as he reviews the past, he, he, we speak of the motive of Paul's ministry. And his motive, and hopefully our motive, is the number one, to please the Lord. I want to please the Lord. I want to live in a way that pleases God. I want to do what pleases God. But then secondly, because of his motive, it affected his manner. Because his motive was to please God, it affected the manner in which he went about serving others. The manner of Paul's ministry. Verses 18 and 19. And 19 is really where we're going to camp out in these next really two sessions that we're together. He says, I serve the Lord with great humility. He's describing the manner of how he goes about his ministry. Very important. He goes, I go about it with great humility, with tears, although I was severely tested by the plots of the Jews and with, a, with a, um, an endurance, with an endurance and a perseverance. Let's look at this together. A consistent life. Number one, he had a consistent life that could pass inspection. That he carried himself in such a way that he was above board in how he behaved and how he lived. Again, um, here it is, the manner of Paul's ministry. A consistent life. Remember, he says, you saw how I lived. He goes, I lived it out front. I wasn't someone that you just saw on a TV screen. And you didn't know, you know, how I lived or, you know, what number wife I was on. None of that. No, no, no. Didn't say none of that nonsense. He goes, I lived among you. I toiled among you. Very important to be able to live the life. Isn't it right? If we're going to witness to the people at work, very important that we live it in front of them. If we're going to talk to a neighbor about the Lord, it's important that we live it in front of them. He says, consistent life, like a past inspection. And then this is where we're going to get next two weeks. He served with great humility. Great humility. He served with tears. That means he really cared about what he did. He wept over the lost. He wept over the church. He was pained in his heart when he saw the, the wolves try to come in and destroy the flock, okay, with tears. And he served through severe trials. He was a noble soldier. Paul's the one that wrote, endure hardship like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And if we're going to really try to please the Lord, you know what? That means I'm going to put up with stuff for the glory of God. I'm not going to quit real easy. I'm not going to cop an attitude if I get uncomfortable. This is for the glory of the Lord. I put up with a lot for the glory of the Lord. Amen? Because I want to please the Lord. I'll put up with a lot of the enemy's harassments and, and, and resistances, and that's what we're getting at here. A consistent life that could pass inspection. Look at 2 Corinthians 4 and 2. And again, we're talking, he carried himself. How Paul carried himself. We see in this verse here, these, how Paul, how, how, how he carried himself, how he presented himself, and how he presented the message. This is important. Um, the manner of our ministry. How do I carry out my ministry? Am I rough, abrasive, selfish, um, angry? Because again, when we get to Paul's talking about because my desire, my motive is to please the Lord, it expresses itself in the manner in which I minister. And so we see here, Paul writes, 
Rather, we've renounced secret and shameful ways. So you see how Paul carried himself, how Paul presented his message. We have renounced secret and shameful ways. We don't use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. He goes, Listen, we're not doing anything secret, anything um, sneaky, anything shameful. We're carrying ourselves as becoming men and women of God. Amen? We're not just going to talk about the Lord. We're going to walk as people that know the Lord. We're going to present ourselves as proper ambassadors. We've renounced secret and shameful ways. When I didn't know the Lord, I lived in shameful ways. Amen? But now that I'm representing the Lord Jesus, you know what? It's very important how I carry myself. It's very important that they're not going to believe the gospel if I'm living like I shouldn't live. I'm going to carry myself. I always remember who I represent. Always remember who you represent. Isn't that right? I'll tell you, I'm a, I'm a, well, down here you got to wear shorts, but where I'm from, I want jeans and t-shirt. Just give me jeans and t-shirt, all right? But I'll tell you what, when I got to go to school to represent my kids when they were little, I made sure, and it's probably the only time I'd ever use reverend. I never used, no, but, I, but I'm, I'm representing them. And see, this world does a lot by what it sees, right? God might see the heart, but you know what man's looking at? He's looking on the outside. Before I could speak to your heart, you're going to judge something on the outside. So I'm going to make sure I present myself. If we're going to minister properly as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, we have to care about how we present ourselves to those we're trying to reach. So Paul says, we've renounced secret and shameful ways. And he says, you know what? We do not use deception, nor do we distort, or that word distort. We don't, we don't dilute the word of God. We, we, don't, we don't tailor it just so it's, it's okay to whatever the culture says is okay. Amen? I mean, we're not, we're not making it abrasive, but we're not diluting it. There's a big difference. See, you can present it lovingly, but still clearly and accurately. He says, on the contrary, no, 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 we're not distorting the word. On the contrary, we are setting forth the truth plainly. I like that. Making it plain. <laughs> Gotta make it plain. Amen? No, plain, no sense in saying it if you're not going to make it plain. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. We're talking about the manner of our ministry. How do we carry out our representation of Jesus Christ? We talk about being an ambassador, but how do I carry out my ambassadorship? Well, Paul talks here about how I present myself and then how I present the message. I've got to present myself in a way that is proper for someone that calls himself a child of God. And I've got to communicate the message in, in, in a clear way, not diluted, not watered down, but not embrace it plain and loving. And all right. Because Paul's motive and his motivation was to please and glorify the Lord, it affected the manner or the expression of his ministry. It because his motive was to glorify Jesus. He had such a burning desire to glorify and please the Lord that it affected how he carried out his ministry. i never forget years ago, um, I probably, young, probably just a youngster, probably uh, late 20s, whatever, and um, I get frustrated about something. Didn't take much back in those days. I get frustrated about something, and I was probably turning up the heat a little too much. And I could hear the Lord, I could hear that spirit pulling on me. And he simply said, son, don't forget whose they are. Don't forget whose they are. Whew. Stop me in my tracks. Because I don't know, I don't know about you, I grew up saying, I don't care who you are. Isn't that right? You put your pants on like I put it. You, you know, you know how people are raised, right? I care who you are. Uh, you know what I mean? Right? And that's how a lot of us are raised. And I, you carry that over in life. I don't care who you are. But then the Lord reminded me, it's not who they are, it's whose they are. And they're mine. So watch your tone. I'm telling you. I'm a 29, 30 year old pastor getting fed up with something. Didn't take much back then, all right? Didn't take much, all right? But I'm telling you, I'm hearing it. I'm hearing it. And the Spirit just says, Watch it, son. Don't forget whose they are. Wow. Wow. They're God's people. So the manner in which I minister to you better be pleasing to Him. The tone in the flavor and the fragrance amen better be pleasing to him now we know we know this we we know um that jesus peter paul moses we know at times 
they, 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 were, they, they rebuked. At times they brought correction. Jesus cleansed the temple. Paul confronted Peter. We understand that. Mo we understand that. But that, write this down, that was not the norm of their ministry. That would not describe the normal ministry. Their normal ministry would be described as loving and tender and compassionate and, and faithful and, 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 and sacrificial. Jesus said a bruised reed. <laughs> I won't break. A smoldering stick, I won't. Amen? I mean, Paul's going to describe himself later on. We'll see. He goes, he describes his manner of ministry. I was like a mother to you. He goes, I was like a father to you. That doesn't sound like someone that's rough and rough and beating up someone over the head, does it? So we've got to recognize that as I minister, the manner of my ministry, though there are times for firmness, there are times where the Bible says, that, you know, there's, there's time for correction. There is a time for rebuke. But the key here. When we study the Word of God, that was the exception. That was not the norm. The normal manner that these men ministered, loving, sincere, compassionate, sacrificial, faithful, diligent, willingly, persevering. Again, Paul described himself, we'll look at it later, as a mother, a father, an enduring soldier, an enduring soldier. If you really love the Lord, you will put up a lot to win someone for the Lord. If you really love the Lord, you will put up with a lot to really reach someone to go farther with the Lord. Jesus, of course, described as a faithful shepherd. These are the norms. This is the norm. The other stuff happens, and yeah, you've got to obey the Lord, but this is the norm. This is the norm. So we notice here that, number one, the manner of his ministry. Paul describes it. He says um, he served with great humility, with great humility. When we talk about humility... We're going to talk about it. There's three expressions of humility. Number one, common sense. I humble myself before God. We, that's throughout the Bible. But I also have to humble myself before man. That's also in the Bible. But I also have to humble myself in my appraisal of myself and have a humble appraisal of myself, putting it all in perspective. So let's, let's, let's talk with this a little bit. Again, the servant, the servant is humility. A servant is not greater than his master. And we know that Jesus was humble. Amen? The Bible says he, he left glory. Philippians 2. He took on the body of a human being. He became a servant. Humbled himself. Became obedient unto death. Jesus. And so again, a servant's not greater than his master. If Jesus walked in great humility, the manner in which I walk and minister should be with great humility. Paul considered himself a servant. In fact, how many times Paul said, I'm the least of the apostles? Again, his estimate of himself. He's having a humble estimate. Paul served humbly, not as a religious celebrity, demanding others to serve him. He came to do the serving and the helping and the giving. He didn't come to get, 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 get. He came, how can I give? How can I bless? How can I contribute to the cause of Christ? Amen? That's what we're looking at here. That's what we're looking at. And there's a great danger in the church today because we've built up so much on one side of the ledger. You know, the, you, you, balance. Balance is important. But you, you, you describe one, the ledger of the good things of God and the blessings of being a Christian that we created a group that everything's about me. I want a blessing. If it's not good for me, if it doesn't meet my need. But we should come with an attitude saying, where can I serve? Where can I help? The battle's on. It's not that. That's baby. Baby time is over. I'm a man. I want to serve somewhere. I want to contribute to the cause. I believe God died for me. I believe he's coming back again. I believe there's a heaven and a hell. Therefore, give me something to do. Give me anything to do. But let me do something for the cause of Christ. Something burns within us to do that. Am I right or am I wrong? You know if some enemy came across our borders, we'd be signing up. You know that we would. We take care of our wives and children, and we'd be signing up. Well, where do we enlist? You know this. Someone came over that border, Canadian border, Mexican border. If our nation was in peril, we'd be going tomorrow. Isn't that right? Well, there's a greater war going on each and every day. It's a war for the souls of men. And the real Christian ought to be stirred in his heart. What can I do? Where's my part of the battle? Where's my place? Where's my place? He served with humility. His goal is to please the Lord and to help others. My goal has to be to please the Lord and to help others. And God has called me to serve them. Jesus says to us, do you love me? Then serve them. Do you really love me? Then serve them. He said that to Peter. Remember, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you really love me? Go ahead and feed them. Go ahead and take care of them. Go ahead and put up with them. Go ahead and protect them. Go ahead and lay down your life for them. 
Look at this, Colossians 1, 24 and 25. Look at Colossians 4, 24 and 25. Paul says, Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. He's saying, the Lord has commissioned me to be the servant of his people. When we look at the Lord and say, Lord, I love you, I love you, love you, he says, good, go bless my people. Go, go tell someone about me. Go, go reach out to someone that's hurting. Go find your place of service and give me your very best. Lord, what can I do? I love you so much. You've done so much for me. Jesus, I'll do anything. Love the five-year-old. Get in the van and pick them up and be trustworthy that you'll pick them up every time you pick them up. If you love me and you really want to show it, it's good to shout and good to sing, and that's part and that's biblical, but don't leave it there. Then there's the practical expression of ministry is who can I minister to? Who can I love? If we love him, he calls us to minister to them. The call of God, the call of God. He has commissioned us to be their servants. Now, he served with humility. He served with humility. Let's look at this together. We're going to look at humility. Number one, the attitude, my attitude towards oneself should be humble. My attitude towards, he says, I, with great humility. What does it mean? It means he didn't come in like God's man of faith and power. He didn't come in like he's a big shot. He came in like Jesus as one that served. He didn't come to be served, but to serve. Let's, let's look at this together now. Um, my attitude toward myself. I have to recognize that my accomplishments and my achievements, I've got to put them in perspective. Because anything I do is nothing compared to what he did for me. Amen? And no matter what I've accomplished, it's all by the grace of God anyway. In fact, Jesus said, without him I can do nothing, so I really have to put my accomplishments. Look at 2 Corinthians 3, 4 and 5. 2 Corinthians 3, 4 and 5. And we're going to look at this both in the NIV and the New King James. And Paul says, such confidence as this is ours through Christ before God. So number one, notice, we are a confident people, but it's not a confidence in ourselves. It's a confidence that comes through Jesus Christ. Amen? We are a confident people. We can face things without losing it. We can go through things and keep the joy of the Lord. Amen? We are a people that are a confident people, but the confidence is not in myself or not in my abilities. It's in the Lord. Amen? So again, he goes, such confidence as this is ours through Christ, through Christ, through Christ. Through Him we can do all things. Through Him we can endure pandemics. Through Him we can face every season of life. Through Him we can, amen? We don't have to lose our testimony. We don't have to lose our victory. Why? We're confident, not in ourselves, through Christ. But he goes on now in the next verse and he says, not that we are confident in ourselves. <laughs> hey, hey, this, uh, it's not, I'm not doing a John Wayne, I'm just Mr. No, 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 no. This confidence comes from the Lord. This confidence is because Jesus is in me and his spirit is in me. Not that we are confident in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves. Here's Paul. <laughs> We're not claiming this for ourselves. But our confidence comes from God. I like how the, the New King James will say it, use the word, and we have such trust through Christ toward God. And we have such trust through Christ. We've got a confidence, but it's through Christ. We should be a bold, daring, unafraid people. Amen? If I read my Bible right, he hadn't given us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. Is that in the book? Is that still in the book? I think it's still in the book. Amen? So we all be bold and we all be confident, but it's not a confidence that brings an arrogance, because it's not a confidence derived of our own guts and strength. It comes from the Lord, and we have such a trust through Christ toward God, and I like this. Not that we are sufficient. I just like that word. Maybe it's how I memorized it a hundred years ago. Not that we are sufficient sufficient of ourselves to think anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency, it comes from God. We're not sufficient in ourselves, but man, we're sufficient. We're not confident in ourselves, but man, we're confident. Amen? It comes from the Lord. It comes from knowing Him and walking with Him and believing His promise and recognizing we have the power of His Holy Spirit. But it's not in ourselves. You see, there, there's my perspective of myself, how I measure and evaluate myself. You see? And because we recognize it's all the Lord, 
keep you from big head. Keep us from thinking we're too good to do. 1 Corinthians 3 and 5. 1 Corinthians 3 and 5. Same thing here. We're looking at the aspect, the attitude towards oneself. We talk about humility. Humility speaks of our attitude towards ourselves. Very important. If I'm going to have the proper manner in which I minister, I, I can't be thinking too highly of myself. Amen? Isn't that right? Servants, you, just, you know. But yet he asked me to do things that might be daring and challenging. If I can be confident, but I'm confident in him. All right. Look what Paul writes here. Uh, the, the church, the church is having problems. They, they were getting into little schisms because one liked this preacher and one liked that one and this one belonged to him and they really liked him. And Paul says, hey, 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 come on. What after all is Apollos? Apollos was a powerful preacher back then. All right. What after all is Apollos? He goes, what is Paul? <laughs> what is Paul? You know what? We're only servants. Isn't that right? Only servants. Don't bow down, kiss anyone's ring. Only servants. Abomination, that stuff. We'll find out one day. Only servants. This is Paul talking. Don't kiss my ring. We're just servants. Just servants. Through whom you came to believe. As our Lord has assigned to each his task. We're just, we're just carrying out our marching orders. Amen? We're just doing what the one that saved us and died for us asked us to do. That's all. We're just servants. Don't, 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 don't. So one part about humility is our attitude towards myself. If I can put myself in perspective, it'll help me serve others. How about that? Amen? All right. All right. Now let's, it's okay now. Secondly, attitude, not only towards myself, an attitude towards how I interact with others. Now this is really where it comes down to the nitty-gritty, my, my manner of ministry is humbling myself towards others, considering you better, considering you more important. Isn't that right? You know, marriages work good that way, don't they? If each one considers each other, you've got a great combination then, don't you? Amen? can't just be one, but when they're both, well, this is how it works in ministry. This is how we, we get along, we get things accomplished for, for the Lord. Our attitudes, how I interact with others. Let's look at um, Luke 14, 11. Luke 14, 11. The context of this story is, is Jesus is saying, listen, uh, when you go to a banquet, don't go fighting for the best seat. And then you know, the, the guy will say, you go in the back. Um, he's, the context, jockeying for position, jockeying for praise, jockeying for titles. I want all the credit. I want, you know. He says, listen, 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 listen. You just find a place and serve and let God lift you up. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. How about that? Amen? That it helps me. It'll help me minister more to you when I think more of you than I do me. Well, you know, um, you know Kathy's going to be cleaning, does a great job cleaning. When she comes in, and it's not so much so we give her a plaque, but she says, you know what, God's people are going to be coming in. You know, we might get a visitor that comes. I'd hate for them to see it, this thing looking, and you go the extra mile. Isn't that right? Isn't that right? And you're there to teach your class, and, oh, you only get two or three. Why are you preparing so much? Oh, number one, they're worth it, but you never know. That new family might come, and I want them to see that what we do here is for the glory of God, the manner, the effort, the excellence. I, well, I'm trying to please the Lord. I want to please God. I want so much to please Him. I was on my way to hell. And he had mercy on me. I deserved hell. I knew better. I totally, re I just, man, and God in his mercy. And he don't ask me to do a whole bunch. He hasn't asked any of us to be martyrs, has he? Let's be honest. Anyone here suffering? Don't look around. We're all doing pretty good, aren't we? Yeah, yeah we're doing pretty good. What's he asked? Be faithful. Find your place in my church. Use your gifts and talents. Get involved in world evangelism. Do these things, do these things, amen? This affects my manner. My motive affects my manner. And when I live for the glory of God, when I live, number one, to please Jesus. See, Jesus can't be my Buddha. I come to him when I need a blessing. I come to him, you know, Lord, here's my list. Don't work like that. Lord, you're my Lord. 
I want to please you. He's so good and full of mercy, I can bring him request. I can ask him. He blesses and he gives promises. But I got to get that in order. But when I really want to please him, it affects everything I do. You give 110% when you do it unto the Lord. He said, man, I, I was naked. You clothed me. I don't remember that. I wanted to get to church real bad. And I didn't have a car. And you went out of your way and you, you picked me up. And my two little kids. Well, Lord, I, I, don't, I don't remember picking you up. No, it was that single mom that didn't have a car and you picked her up and you took the kids to Sunday school and now they know the Lord 20 years later. Thanks. Jesus said, you did it unto me. You see, when I am passionate about pleasing the Lord Jesus, it affects how I minister to those that were made in his image and redeemed by his blood. It causes me to work with excellence, with diligence, with faithfulness. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Isn't the Lord good? Amen. Are we getting it? Are we getting it? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look if you would Philippians 2, 3 and 4. Philippians 2, 3 and 4. Very familiar verse. Very familiar verse. But again, humility, the attitude of how I interact with each other. Don't do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility. Here it is. In humility, consider others. Consider others better than yourselves. Prefer others. I think some of the King James prefer others. But consider others better. Go on the extra mile. What's that next line? Each one should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. Let's get back and we say, Jesus, I love you. So do you love me? Bless them. Jesus, I really love you, Lord. I really want to, you know, just get close to you. Do you? Go ahead and serve them. Lord, you didn't hear it. I just want, yeah, I want you to come down and knock me down and I want to see some gold dust and you want my glory? Give a cup of cold water to a kid that goes home, might get beat when he gets home because he comes from a lousy family and he needs someone to love him. How about that? How about that? Amen? I had some lady one years ago, and God bless, whatever, and um, she brings some book about angels and I was trying to be nice with her. Well, nice, nice, but I don't think we're going to do it here. Just not, 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 not in this church. And I, I just thank you very much. But what broke my heart is at one time, I, she had what I call a spiritual midlife crisis. So I knew her history. She come from a good church, used to serve faithfully. Now she wants to run after all the world looking for angels' feathers and stupidity like that. And I feel like saying, what's wrong with you? You'd get more accomplished sitting with three little children, little eight-year-old girls, and teaching them John 3, 16. You want the, that's the glory of God. That's the, that's the honor and glory of God. Then following this nonsense so you can have some strange out of the experience. You want an experience? He says, I was hungry and you fed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was in prison and somebody visited me. I was in the nursing home and I just... Someone just came and sat with me. Wow. Jesus said, you did it to me. If you did it to me, you did it to me. Wow. That's all right. Amen? Amen. If I want to please him, it affects. It affects. And then that, that's the last verse we got in that group. What's the next verse we got, guys? 1 Peter 5, 5 and 6. Again, notice how it'll, it'll, it's going to say both. Our humility is expressed towards one another and then, of course, to the Lord. Young men, in the same way, be submissive to those who are older. All of you, all of us, clothe ourselves with humility towards one another, towards one another. You see, some people, I'll humble myself before God, but yeah, then humble yourself before your brother will. You know? <laughs> then you're missing it. Then you're missing it. Clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Because God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. That context, he's talking about how I interact with my brother. Amen? I should respect my brother, be civil to my brother, honor one another. Now the next verse, 
after we've humbled with each other, now he talks about humbling ourselves before God. Humble yourself under the God's mighty hand that he'll lift you up. So we see both of that. All right, humility, humility. This attitude of humility gives the expression, the, the fragrance, the tone, the flavor to our ministry, to our interacting, to our efforts for the glory of God. Not only how I prepare, but how I carry out my labor for the Lord. Look how Paul described the manner of his ministry. 1 Thessalonians 2, go ahead guys. 1 Thessalonians 2, we're going to look at verses, yeah, we're going to look at verses 6 through 8. Again, this is how Paul describes. You know, sometimes we, we see Paul, he, he was a tough guy. You can't get beat up like he got beat up and, and keep coming down and, you know, and keep getting back up, right? You, you got to be tough. I mean, he wasn't a wimp. But you, sometimes we think Paul's this abrasive, you know, spit and snarl and just damn everyone. That wasn't Paul at all. Paul built churches and laid down his life that the lost could be saved. He laid down his life so heathen. The heathen could come to know the true and living God. Now, notice the context here. Very important. We were not looking for praise from men, nor from you or anyone else. Remember, again, he's not a man pleaser. He's not there. It's nice when people appreciate you. We'd be a liar to say we didn't. It's proper. But that's not the ultimate goal. That's not our ultimate motivation. He says, we're not looking for praise from men. Da, da, da. He goes, you know what? As apostles of Christ... We could have been a burden to you. We had authority to be more demanding. We had authority to be a little firmer. But because our motive was to please the Lord, and when you want to please the Lord, he gives you a heart for his people. You can't walk in the Spirit and not have the love of God flowing out of you. Amen? You, you can't be full of the Spirit of the one that loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son and, and not have love for other people in you. And so, now this is how Paul describes his ministry. He goes on. He could have been a burden to you, but you know what? We were gentle among you like a mother, literally nursing her children, caring for her children. Paul described his ministry because I was gentle. My, my, because my motive was for the glory of God. Because I wanted to please God. The things that please God began to stir in my heart. I was moved by the things that move God. Amen? Isn't that a good thing? And he said, sometimes we get, that, we get that scripture a little confused. He gives us the desires of his heart. Let's pray to get his desires in our heart, and then, you know, let's get it in the proper order. But listen, he says, Paul described himself, his manner of ministry, I carried myself towards you, not as a rough, tear you down, damn you, blah, blah, blah. How dare you wear that to church? Who are you? That's not God at all. That's no stop. They missed it. I'm telling you, they missed it. It's not Bible. It's not Bible. Gentle among you, like a mother caring for her little children. Mothers are gentle than babies. You know what I mean? They, they're gentle, nursing. The gentleness. What's that next verse? In fact, you know what? We loved you so much. Remember that riot when he goes to town? He's just like getting death threats. I mean, it's, it's Paul, but he says, we love you so much. Can you say this about your Sunday school class? Can you say this about your little group, your home group, or your Bible study group? We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well, because you had become so dear to us. Amen. They're not a burden. They're dear to me. They're, they're not just something, oh, i got to go and prepare. Oh, my goodness. I, I, I love them. It's a joy. What a privilege and an honor. Let's go to the next group of verses. So he calls them. He describes himself. How is the manner of my ministry? Doesn't sound like a bully. Doesn't sound like someone that's domineering and abrasive, does it? He says, I, I, I minister the truth. I set forth the truth plainly. He casting out demons. He's doing the job, right? But he says, like a, a gentle mother. And now look, he's got, no, um, go back to um, the, the verse and the other scriptures. Um, and now he says, there you go, perfect. And he says, now as a caring mother, from a gentle mother, now a caring father. He says, you know how we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children. Paul's describing his ministry, the manner of his ministry. He says, like a father, 
a caring father. You know, fathers care. That's why, where were you? Who are you with? No more. What are you up to? What class are you taking? A lot of questions. A caring father. It's a natural for the father. Natural for the mother to hug and to nurse and right and all that. Very, very natural. Father, very caring, very protective. Who are you with? What's going on? Amen? It wasn't just like, well, what do I care? You can send your money in and do what you No, 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 no. I got a father's heart. No, I care, I care. I dealt with you as a father deals with his own children. The fathers know how you deal with your children, right? You can, there can be a firmness, but a love, is, it's the weirdest thing, isn't it? Uh, what a strange, uh, that mixture of a father's heart, of a father's heart. And Paul says, this is how the man of my ministry was. And because I was a caring father, he goes, look what I did. He says, I, I was encouraging and I was comforting, but I was urging you, live lives worthy of God. He, I was there calling you on to greater heights. I was there telling you, live wholeheartedly for Jesus. Don't be satisfied with some low living. Give your best for the Lord. Live worthy for the Lord. God's got more for you. Give it to God. Paul talks about being gentle like a mother and, and, um, and caring and caring, caring like a father. And then we see here, John 13, John 13. And now we see the example of the Lord Jesus, again, carrying out our ministry as we carry out our ministry. John 13, we look at verses 2 through 5, then, then 12 through 17. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas. Go ahead. And Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and is returning to God. He had all things, and he picked up a towel. God gave him all authority. And he didn't pick up a sword, didn't pick up, uh, you know, picked up a towel to serve. Isn't that something? All things under his power. He knew where he came from, where he was going. Amen? And what did he do? He served. He had all power and authority. And what did he do with it? He served. Let's go on to the next one. So he got up from the meal, took off that outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist. Now, Jesus, I'm not washing your feet. I'm not washing your feet. I mean, Jesus, that's a different story. I'll wake up, they'll pick Jesus up and take him to church. But I don't want to, you know, they mess up my car. You got to bring it to where we're at, right? There's no sense in just making it be a story here. <sighs> now that I, your Lord, teacher, have washed your feet, wash one another's feet, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master. We're not greater than Jesus, are we? Nor is a messenger greater than the one that sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do these things. The father had placed all things in his hand and he picks up a basin and a towel. Isn't that something? The sovereign took the place of a servant. He dignified, Jesus, in this story, with his life, dignified service. In the Roman culture, being a servant was a low thing. You were a slave. It wasn't anything noble. It was not, and you know, I'll be honest with you. Sometimes when you get around people that don't know the Lord, Sometimes you got to watch your lingo. We got to watch our lingo. But sometimes I say, "Oh, that person was a real servant," and I had to catch myself because they didn't understand what I meant. They they they, they might have misinterpreted it, think, thinking it was a negative. But for my world, when you say someone was a real servant, that is an honor. You're honoring them. Because in the Christian world, Jesus was the greatest servant of all. He calls us to be servants. It's a noble thing. It's something to applaud for someone to be a servant. You see. And Jesus did this. And, and the Greek and the Roman culture, being a servant, are you kidding me? Those were slaves. That, that was a low thing. That was an insulting thing. Jesus takes the things of this world and makes them glorifying to God. Isn't that something? He's the sovereign took the place of servant. He dignified sacrifice and service. Let's not ever get caught up 
in this worldly mentality. You see it even in ministry. But let's be willing to do whatever the Lord wants us to do for his glory and do it for him and do it wholeheartedly for him and be faithful. He gives us an example of true Christian ministry. It's humbly serving others. It's not just being weird because we got all power and glory. We, of course we got power and glory. We're full of the Spirit of God. Amen? But like Jesus, how do we use it? How do we respond to it? We should serve others, give to others. He was rich. For our sakes, he became poor. So it's like we close this. We close this. When I'm motivated for the glory of God, when I am motivated and driven to please the Lord, it affects how I minister to men and how I minister to the family of God. It speaks and should produce in my life a quality effort, a proper preparation, an enduring stick to itiveness, a sincerity, a loving affection, an excellent effort, a sincere motivation, a willingness to sacrifice. Paul starts out and he talks about not only his motive was to please the Lord, because his motive really was to please the Lord, it affected the manner that he carried himself and he ministered to others. And the first thing we study, and this is all we can get to tonight, with great humility. When I talk about humility, the appraisal of myself, if I can get that right, it's a lot easier, amen? But then my, I'm humbling myself before you. I'm going to honor my brother and sister. And then ultimately, I honor the Lord. I humble myself before the Lord. The next thing we're going to look at next time is with tears. He talks about tears. <sighs> with great tears he served. Paul had a compassionate heart. Paul, um, his love for God caused him inward pain at times when he saw people running from God, when he saw the church under attack from the wolves and so forth. And we're going to look at that. We're going to look next time at three things in particular that moved Paul to tears. As we study our Bibles, we'll see some that moved Paul to tears. And we're going to say, God, give me that heart. God, give me that heart. God, give me that heart. If you can get the heart, you got everything. Amen? If you can get the heart, and you got the heart, that's it. That's it. We're going to pray. We're going to pray. It's such an honor to be saved. He don't need me. What a privilege it is that he saved me. He didn't have to save me. Amen? He could have given. Well, it's a privilege that he would die for me. So it's an honor to serve him. And I want to keep that in my mind. And I got to remind myself of that. I'm going to go the extra mile. This is for Jesus. I'm going to go the extra mile. He died for them. I can put up with them. You know what I mean, right? <laughs> he gave his best. I can give a little. I can give, I can give a little more. I can, give, you know, I can do a little more, right? Yeah, let's remember this. Father, we thank you for the lessons in, of your word. We thank you for the Apostle Paul and these, these principles that he's giving us, things that we can measure ourselves with things that we can um, meditate on and renew our minds with. So, Lord, help us to have a proper motivation that will greatly affect the manner in which we carry ourselves and how we represent you and how we minister to others. Help us to greatly appreciate the salvation you've given us. And let our hearts have a continual burning desire to please you and to honor you above all things. And we pray, Lord, that our desire to please you would show itself in how we love each other and how we give one to another and how we serve and go the extra mile one for another. Help us, Lord, to improve, not only in the motive, but in the manner of our ministry. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you. Have a great night.